Photography Daily. Hello and welcome. A real mixed kit bag today, if you will. Phil Minot on knowing your subject. It seems to me that there's a lot of photographers who don't prep. And a friend of this show we've had on before, Dennis Lee, on first cameras and a trip down memory boulevard. You see, you just reach in and you you, you pull one out and, you know, the, the press is running, it's loud, everybody's got their earmuffs on and... <laughs> You just pull your your paper out of this out, out of the, the feed there, and you open it up, and you look, and it's like, all right, that's great. Today's edition has been written by you, really. A couple of questions just nudged me to take some clips from the bank of short interviews that's building up with the show archive nicely. So. Keep sending in your thoughts and your questions to the mailbag address, studio at photographydaily.show. And that address is always in the show notes and on the show's website, of course. The way the archive works is that each week I'm having conversations with a handful of photographers who've either been suggested, better still personally introduced, or whom I've researched and think you'll enjoy hearing from or learning about. These chats have become the 10-minute shorter Monday to Friday airings called Snapshot Editions, Some of the interviews, such as Dan Milner, coming soon, Jack Lowe from the Lifeboat Station Project, and Paul Sanders, the incredible landscape photographer, will be much longer features, focus editions. And then launching in July, a new membership area where you can hear and download workshop editions for professionals and those about to embark on a career in portraits and weddings and commercial and maybe landscape work. Members will get the full Focus Editions and all Workshop Editions in this area, although you'll also get some sound bites too on the free daily, so you won't miss out. Think of the Daily Edition as your free photography zine each day, and on the other shows, the Focus and Workshop shows, your special membership to a real audio bookshop of advice on moving your business or your photography forward during these more challenging but also creative times. So, first up today, a tip. Although it's not a tip from the mailbag, it's from a recent guest, Phil Minot, the photojournalist and commercial event and portrait photographer based in Cambridge. Part of his chat fits very well with a question sent in by Bryce Fegan, who, I'm paraphrasing, seemed to be having trouble drawing character out of his sitters during corporate portrait shoots and wondered how he could possibly improve on the experience. Over to Phil for some thoughts about planning and prepping, and he doesn't pull any punches. It seems to me that there's a lot of photographers who don't prep about the job they're doing. And by prep, I mean, it doesn't matter what the job is. It could be a commercial job. I'm like most general photographers. I do a bit of everything. But, you know, you're traveling between photo assignments. You should be spending your time on Facebook. You should be spending your time using your brain. Obviously, look where you're going. But also, you need to be spending your time thinking about the photo shoot and how you're going to plan it. From the moment when you arrive in the car park, how am I going to get my gear in the building? How am I going to get on with the receptionist? Because they're really key people. I learned very, very early on. In fact, it was a radio uh, lesson that I learned um, where I had to do a book interview. And the author turned up and I did him the incredible disservice of just reading the press release. So it didn't take long, I think probably a minute or two into the interview before um, he said to me, I don't believe you've read this book, have you? Um, Took his headphones off, put them on the desk calmly and walked out the studio mid-sentence. Interesting, sorry to interrupt you. Do you suspect if you'd said from the beginning... I'm sorry, I haven't had time to read your book, then he may well have been more receptible to carrying the interview on. Maybe, but it did teach me after that to always do, as you're suggesting here, the research. And certainly a a Magnum photographer that I interviewed a couple of years back, I remember doing the research on him, yes, from, from his website, and yes, from some books, but actually from his daughter's Instagram feed because oh, okay. she told me so much more about him than yeah. I think he would have ever done. And I think that that's where research comes in. I think you're right. And I also think um, some people, you know, most people are modest in life uh, and even celebrities, you know, because, you know, we know them as celebrities, but they're always acting. So yeah. when you're on a one-to-one with them, they're actually quite modest people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I photograph where I am. I'm, I'm based in Cambridge and I do a lot of stuff around because Cambridge has lots of research and uh you know, um, academics and stuff. And there's some amazing people here have done amazing things. Mm. But I always find particularly with scientists and researchers, they're very modest people. So it's really hard sometimes to get and come out of their shell. 
So I quite often say people to, and I've checked out what, particularly it's a team, I've checked out what they've done, and I'll say stuff to them like, come on, guys, come on, you have changed tens of thousands of lives. Do you not realise this is a reason to celebrate? You know, we're here to be mm-hmm. And actually sometimes because people are shy, perhaps, you actually have to go more extreme and you have to become the show, showman, show person, yeah. and you need to get them out of their shell. But but you you can flatter people, but you don't uh, don't make it up. It all has to be truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can tell people, you know, and if, if if people have done great things in their life, and most people have, you know, when they get to a certain age in their career, and then it's good to remind people that hey, you know, you're the guy you invented. You know, you're the guy who found out about BRAF, which is a lot of cancer treatments is now based on, mm. and. Um, when I was photographing a particular gentleman, he was so – I could see he was pleased and he completely gave me a lot more time than he should have done. Yeah. And I think it's being respectful to people. Yes. Yeah. And the other tip – can I? Can I I'm going to leave you one more tip. Um, I was very, very lucky. I used to do a lot of work for uh, uh, Professor Stephen Hawking and his office. And um, the reason – I used to photograph him a lot and uh, I know they wouldn't mind me saying, but it would be occasionally you'd take a photograph and – you'd need to have to adjust something and he wouldn't obviously be able to do it himself. I would stop the photo shoot, even if there was other photographers there and mm. say, Oh, excuse me, professor. Do you mind if we move your scarf around a bit? Mm. That sort of stuff. People appreciate that. Mm. And they know you're taking control. And it's courtesy as well. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. And also, you know, you look at someone, you say, would I want to be photographed like that? A couple of weeks back, we were talking press work and how the landscape has changed, and it seemed you liked to hear how it worked. A trip down memory boulevard, as I called it a moment ago. Well, Dennis Lee is back with his tales of San Francisco and New York newspaper photography. First up, though, and prompted by Harry Whiteside, who dropped a mail on first cameras after a mention of the kit we collect on the Friday Photo Walk two weeks back, episode 22. My first SLR was a Zenit E, film SLR that would be, of course, but the one I used for my my first adventures into being a professional photographer was the Nikon, Nikon, Nikon. There's a debate in itself, F5. And I've just started to really use it again. In fact, I actually have it here, and it's a real brick of a thing. It's a super camera, a lot larger than the digital kit I now employ, but more automated than uh, what you're about to to hear it's a steady won't let you down camera as long as the batteries last out and you know you've made a picture hang on a minute by the satisfying clunk that says i've done my job anyway seems dennis had a similar passion for his first nikon 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 you say tomato i say tomato so my first nikon body was a a nikon f2 as fantastic camera it had a a prism that you could take off and and change it with with other uh different finders it had a sports finder available it had a waist level finder available and it had a plain prism available which is what i eventually moved to the photonic prism had a meter built inside of it but it was pretty big and it took up a lot of space if uh, you know in the camera bag so the plain prism was really low really sleek nothing on top of it the hot shoe for this camera was actually a an accessory that you had to put on top of the film rewind knob so there was nothing on top of the prism which meant that there was no meter inside of the camera when you looked into the viewfinder all you saw was your focusing screen and uh, your image that was it you know there were some focus aids in the center there was i had a split screen with a micro prism around it i think later on i moved to just a, a micro prism focusing uh, screen and uh, so that was that was my primary camera body and i used that without motor drive with a, a 28 millimeter f2 lens that was my daily go-to body that that lens hardly ever came off that camera uh, it's the one i wore around my neck then i had a bag i had a very small i, I eventually got to a very small donkey bag which carried a, a second body which uh was an f2 as with a motor drive and then that changed to an f3 Three P, which was a uh, F three professional model, which was very very rare. Mm. It had a special film back that would stop the film rewind with the leader out, which was which was kind of handy. 
that meant that you didn't have to open the film canister when you wanted to process film. You would just pull the film right back out of the canister onto a reel when you loaded it. So that camera was in the bag with a motor drive, and that would be my telephoto camera for the most part. So with it in the bag would be a, a 20. I generally had the 20 on that camera body inside the bag because it fit better. And then I had a, a 50 and a 105 and a 180. And the, the 50 and 105, I took two rear lens caps and epoxied them together so that the two lenses could be held like as a single tube, kind of opposing one another. You, Explain that. Okay, so you have you have the uh, the rear lens cap, right? It fits on the back of the lens. Mm-hmm. You take two of those and you epoxy them. You epoxy the outside rear cap of those together uh, right. so that the open ends are opposing each other. Right. And then you just put two lenses together on that cap. So then two lenses would be like one slightly longer telephoto, yeah, and yeah. that would fit in one sleeve of the camera bag. Oh, yeah. Because the camera bag only had two, two yeah, sleeves. Yes, so it was very yeah. small. And then on the, in the other sleeve, I had a, uh, a 180, 2.8. So, it was, so my, my entire, my entire uh, lens repertoire was a, uh, a 20 f4, 28 f2, 50 1.4, 105 2.5, and a 180.28. And was flash in the bag as well? Yeah, I carried uh, on the outside of the bag, Domkey made these pouches that were the perfect size for a, uh, a flash. And I would carry either one or two flashes, depending on what I was doing. And yeah, and then there was a little front pocket, and there was a pocket in the lid of the bag where I would, in the front pocket, I would carry film and I think some uh, PC cords for the flash. Maybe maybe a few extra batteries. That was probably it, yeah. yeah. I want to get on to your, your days, what they were like as a photojournalist, how many assignments you would receive, what, what the hours were like. I'm imagining it's not nine to five. Well, I'm hoping it's not really because I'm back <laughs> to my romantic notion of thinking that as a photographer, you are on call 24-7. Right. Those calls didn't come too often, but they came occasionally. And, you know, that was from the newsroom listening to the scanner and something big was going down. So you got a call at home, you know, hey, we need you to go up such and such place. I, I started my shift started at one thirty in the afternoon. Right. And later on, it moved to three when they moved the deadlines a little bit later or they decided they wanted me there later at night and, and getting off early. So my regular shift was one thirty to nine thirty, And I would never I, I don't think i ever left at 9 30 i think the earliest mm-hmm. i may have gotten out of there was 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 10 30 you know tip, <laughs> typically I, I it was midnight yeah. you know the last deadline for the press was 11 30 you know i was almost always there until that time there was an excitement wasn't there about putting a paper to bed as they call it yeah it was great yeah. and, it, you, it and was, you want to be there you don't you don't want to miss that bit yeah yeah and if you had you know if you stayed late enough and you had you had something uh, that you were looking forward to seeing published come out. You would you would just wait yeah, and actually go yeah. back to the first press runs yeah. and take the newspaper right off the right off the press. It, yeah. was, it was fantastic. Well, I, I've heard it likened to um, taking a hot bread out the oven as a baker. It was <laughs> you know if you were there, and, and I remember this from working in newspapers, albeit not in the ph- photographic side of it originally. Uh, of actually being there watching a paper come down the run and saying, I want that, that's my one, like a new hot bread roll. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They actually are a little bit warm and the ink is still a little damp, you know, and you you reach, they're all, you know, they're all coming off the back deck and they're they're folded and they've, they've got a single fold in them, you know, they've, mm. they've been folded halfway mm. and not the delivery fold and you and you see, you just reach in and you, you you pull one out, and you know the the press is running. It's loud. Mm. Everybody's got their earmuffs <laughs> on, and you just pull your your paper out of this out, out of the the feed there, and you open it up, and, and you look, and it's like, all right, that's great. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> did Did you enjoy being a, a photographer for for I news? Loved it. Yeah. Do you, yeah. do you, uh, I mean, the people that you work with, because I think people in press can be quite tempestuous, can't they? Some of them can. I, yeah, I, when the, the first newspaper I worked for was a, was a kind of a bunch of old guys, but they were actually a lot of fun. I had, uh, I, I had a, 
a blast hanging out with those guys. Um, and that was the, that was back in the day when some of these guys would actually keep a bottle, you know, in their bottom desk drawer, <laughs> and, and and they would you know they would they would tuck it into something and come up to the dark room and start taking swigs and yeah, like oh yeah. my god <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's going on and and you know three hour lunches holy cow mm. crazy crazy days i'm glad i got to experience a little bit of that it was it was a lot of fun but later on when i that was when i was working part-time just just starting out and summers i would work kind of full-time for the newspaper but when i started working full-time daily out of after college the uh, the staff was a lot younger then and just a lot of really cool people from all over the country you know excited about the work they were doing all writers and it was super energizing doing fun things yeah it was great dennis lee and that's it for today Keep sending in your emails following what you hear, what photography means to you, and any interesting assignments that you've shot or anything interesting about photography. Send them to studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. Make sure you visit the website for links and news of upcoming specials. You can join our mailing list there, a great place to learn about all these other episodes that are coming up. Music in the show was from artlist.io, and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you, and talking with you tomorrow. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.